Lecture number two for Western Civ II, Geoeconomic Revolution. In the 16th century, there were dramatic geoeconomic changes that took place. They were founded upon things which had gone before. So as we begin today, we want to think about keys to the exploration which would open up this economic revolution. Certainly, there were people who were motivated to explore, and this would lead them off on great adventures, and they'd find wonderful things along the way, things which would bring them benefits that they sought. Amongst the motivations that would drive exploration, first of all, would certainly be uh, self-interest, economic gain. Uh, this would drive a lot of people to risk life and uh, uh, resources in order to find profits. So economic gains are certainly uh, one of the keys to exploration, or we might just say gold. Uh, but yet there's other, rev there's other motivations which also help to drive the geoeconomic revolution here in the 16th century in the development of Western civilization. Another motivation would be that people would go out not just for gold, but for God. There'd be religious motivations, uh, particularly to spread the Christian faith uh, amongst other people. This had been an impulse that had been existent for a long time, uh, something that Jesus had challenged people to. Uh, we're going to find that within the Calvinistic circles, there won't be quite the same push for missions as there was amongst others, but uh, uh, certainly we're going to find that various monarchs uh, would see spreading their Christian faith as part of their obligation as rulers over their countries. Uh, they're interested in their subjects uh, having the benefit of their faith, and also uh, they benefited from being able to have some domination over the church, and so religion was another way by which they sometimes controlled people. So we have God uh, as a motivation, and uh, gold is a motivation, but then there's certainly private motivations where people wanted personal glory, uh, particularly in Western Europe. Uh, a lot of storytelling was uh, entertainment, and uh, people wanted to be able to talk about their daring do, as they're still uh, very much influenced by old Germanic ideas about the glories of warfare. And so to be able to go off and exploits and have uh, the opportunity to talk about these things would be something that moved people. So glory, personal glory, might be another motivation. But uh, what we're going to find is there's also uh, political aspirations for those monarchs who aspired to see their economies grow as they came to understand things economic, in terms of economics. Uh, they uh, understood that being economically powerful gave them some political advantages. If they had resources, they could afford to uh, raise larger armies and equip larger armies, which would give them greater power and protection. And uh, another motivation here, as we think about uh, motivation this time, would just be curiosity, people wanting to know about the world. So certainly science would be part of the motivations which would drive uh, these people to take great risks, uh, and they would find there would be significant re rewards in the process. So certainly motivation is a, a key driver, but also another thing that would drive this would be improvements in seafaring. Now if we go back to the time period of the Crusades, what we found is that they had been uh, sailing within the uh, relatively confined waters of the Mediterranean. Uh, certainly you can get far away from the side of land there. Uh, but uh, through their contact with the Arab world, uh, they had developed certain understanding of the stars and uh, equipment by which they could map where they were. And so one of the pieces of equipment that had come from their contact with the East was the astrolabe. And uh, with this you could find where you're at, particularly if you would uh, look at the North Star. Uh, you can find that star by looking out in the dark of night towards the North. And uh, depending upon the latitude where you live, um, look about that many degrees above the horizon and there you'll find the North Star and the other stars, the, the constellations seem to rotate about that uh, North Star. So it seems to be a fixed star here, Polaris. Now in reality the fact is that we're turning so you know, every hour uh, we make about a 15 degree turn 
uh, and so it seems like the stars are slowly turning whereas in fact it's the earth that's turning but uh, what they would discern is they could figure out to some degree where they were on the surface of the northern hemisphere by looking at these stars and uh, with the addition of the compass they could tell where north was even on a cloudy day uh, and uh, this would help them to navigate they could go out and then come back they get some idea about how far they were from uh, uh, where they had started now there had been back in Hellenistic times people who calculated uh, the size of the earth uh, to a relatively close degree and um, so you had people like uh, Aristophanes who had calculated the size of the earth within a couple hundred miles and um, uh, yet this was not widely embraced. Um, they would still be very much influenced by Claudius Ptolemy's uh, geography. Uh, he understood the world to be something of a, a, a globe but they didn't understand what happened in the southern hemisphere and uh, didn't know that there was a Pacific Ocean. And so uh, this would be an issue that uh, would limit their knowledge. But they're going to be great explorers. We'd seen that people have gone exploring. Uh, the Vikings had gone exploring and gone all the way to the New World. And uh, yet if people are going to go exploring, they need to have a fairly, fairly high degree of confidence that they can make, make it back home. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to uh, go sailing. So what happens along the way is that navigation is improving as they have these new technological instruments, the compass and the astrolabe, and they begin to map the coasts of the world and uh, to also observe what the ocean currents were doing and what the wind currents were doing and where you might be becalmed. And so as you head along the coast of Africa, for example, from the Iberian Peninsula and down along the coast of Africa, they could map the coast uh, using land and sea breezes and then make their way back home. And along the way, they'll discover uh, islands and uh, currents that would be advantageous to move and uh, learn where they might hit places where there might be doldrums, where there's no wind blowing and uh, figure out ways to get around those places where the winds were not advantageous. So navigation is going to be an important thing, particularly with the development of maps, but also you have the development of ships. Previously uh, in Europe they had ships which had open decks. Something that's going to be a very important development is the development of the caravel, where they're going to have closed in decks and they're going to build larger and larger ships. Now by our standards uh, the ships that they're going to sail on across uh, the oceans are going to be relatively small. Uh, the size of uh, some wealthy people's private yachts these days. Um, but uh, the important thing about a caravel is it has this closed deck so when the wind blows and the ocean waves crash into the deck it doesn't swamp the boat as it would with a coracle but instead the water would flow over the top of the deck and it would bob up on the surface. wouldn't necessarily be a great ride but kind of like the bobber when you're going fishing this boat's going to float as long as you keep the water out of the interior of the hull. And so having a closed deck allows the, wash, the ocean waves to wash across the surface while the thing keeps floating and uh, making its way across the ocean surface. So improvements in seafaring are going to be a, uh, a key along with uh, the other motivations which are going to open up exploration of the world. The Portuguese are famous for being right at the forefront of this exploration. Uh, they're particularly driven back in the 15th century by Prince Henry, who has the nickname the Navigator. He lived until 1460. His primary goal was one that was driven by uh, religion, where he, he wanted to outflank the Muslims who were so threatening Europe. And what he'd heard was that in the East that there was a priest named John, and he wanted to join Prester John and uh, collaborate together uh, and put the Muslims in the middle and to attack from two fronts. Uh, he was also certainly moved by the desire for guineas. Uh, that would be West African gold. The gold of Europe at this point in time was uh, brought there through middlemen across the uh, deserts of the Sahara uh, from the Gold Coast of Africa, where we have today countries like uh, Guinea and Ghana. Uh, these were the sources of gold that provided gold for Europe. And uh, yet they had to 
trade with Muslim middlemen in order to get gold that they so desired. So by moving down around the coast of Africa, Henry the Navigator could outflank the uh, Islamic supply chain and go directly to the sources of gold in West Africa. Along the way, he established a, uh, uh, a practice of making charts, and uh, these maps would uh, help them to plot the wind and the waves and take advantage of these things and as a result early on in his exploits in 1430 uh, the Portuguese discovered the islands that lay off the coast of uh, of Africa in the Azores in the year 1430 and then very quickly thereafter by 1434 um, you have the Canary Islands and then a few years later in 1456 you have the Cape Verde Islands. So what's happening is they're zigzagging along the coast and they're they're getting to be braver in moving away from the uh, coast out of sight of land uh, because they knew that there were islands that were off the coast there that they subsequently would uh, supply with various resources and certain populations that would help to provide for uh, subsequent uh, expeditions exploring along the coast. And so they would go add to the map and then they'd come back each time and add their knowledge uh, to what they had accumulated previously. So you just keep adding to the map, adding to the map as the years go on. As they turn around the, uh, uh, the, the western hump of Africa, if you wish to look at it that way, they come to the area of the tropics. And five degrees above and below the equator, you have an area known as the doldrums, where the wind doesn't blow terribly much. And so they've learned to use the ocean currents and the wind currents to move along the coast. And particularly by moving out to those islands, they're able to move away from the desert coastline and to move more quickly. And yet, as they've come around the coast, they're, they're still working their way down around the coast. They're going to come uh, to the country of Angola, uh, south of the Congo. And they're going to find that they have uh, relationships that they can build with local uh, kingdoms that exist there. But as they're coming down further down the coast of Africa, they come to another desert. And here there's a strong current, the Benguila Current, which came northward along the coast. And it made progress very, very difficult. And so they're having a very, very hard time. And when they land on the coast, it's a desolate coastline uh, with a desert. And they just couldn't find the resources they need. Uh, to push on down along the coast. So an important development that happens in 1487, uh, 1488, is uh, the exploits of Bartholomew Dias. What he would do is he'd, he'd go away from um, Portugal, down to the Cape Verde Islands, and there, instead of hugging along the coast, he struck out southward, avoiding that cold uh, Benguila current, and for 97 days he would he and his ship would be out of sight of land. They'd sail south, avoiding the Benguila current, and then turning east, catching that current and moving towards Africa. And as a result, he would find what comes to be known as Natal, uh, named after the fact they found it on Christmas Day. And um, what they find is that they found that they could turn around Africa. He doesn't go further up the east coast of Africa. He's got such wonderful discovery that what he does is he turns around after resupplying with water and provisions, uh, takes advantage of that Benguila current, goes up the coastline, and goes back to uh, Portugal. This discovery means that the Portuguese have a key piece of information. Uh, they have figured out how to get around Africa. They know that they've turned the corner on Africa. And so as a result, when uh, Christopher Columbus comes along here in 1492, Diaz is returned, and they already know they, they've turned the corner on Africa. And they know something of how large the world is. They've been keeping their map information privy to themselves. This is not something they widely publish. And so when he comes along proposing that he can go west in order to find the Indies, they know they've turned the corner on Africa and that they think that the pathway is open to them and they know how to get there and so they're not going to fund that expedition. Now it's going to take some time but they're going to explore along the coast of what comes to be known as Mozambique and uh, as they move up towards the area of uh, uh, Kenya and the area of uh, the island of Zanzibar 
uh, they will learn that there's already a uh, shipping practice where the Muslims uh, would sail along the coast and uh, across the Indian Ocean and by learning to follow local pilots uh, they could cross the Indian Ocean taking advance advantage of the seasonal winds of the monsoons. Uh, you'd have to wait until the uh, favorable winds would return you along this way and so a trip to uh, India is going to take Vasco da Gama uh, the best part of three years to make that voyage because you've got to wait for the winds uh, along the way. But in 1497 he's going to embark on a great expedition and they're going to succeed in going all the way to India. What the Portuguese are going to do along the way is they're going to establish uh, periodic land bases that they can use as trading posts and resupply posts. Um, in 1482, they particularly established Elmina in the country of Ghana. Uh, this would be the mine. There's not a mine there, but it's basically a uh, land base uh, from which they would uh, trade for gold. And later on, uh, they're going to be taking slaves from Ghana. And uh, as a result of warfare that happens in West Africa and further south in uh, Angola, uh, they're going to take uh, this human traffic uh, with them uh, as later on they're going to explore the New World. But initially they're looking for gold here in West Africa and they want to have a uh, a supply base, a secure place from which they can engage in trade. So they basically just come up the coast, they don't penetrate into the interior, uh, they have commodities that the indigenous inhabitants want and which, with whom uh, they can trade. Uh, the same practice is going to happen as they, as the Portuguese expand into India and China. Uh, they're going to establish trading posts along the coast. The Portuguese exploration is going to put them out at the front of uh, exploration, but they're going to come to be eclipsed uh, by the Spanish and by the Dutch. Uh, these two people groups are going to intrude upon uh, the Portuguese, but as exploration is going to uh, expand out here, what we're going to find is that in order to keep peace amongst uh, Catholic explorers, uh, particularly the kingdoms of Portugal and Spain, the Pope will make a uh, judgment as far as to divide one half of the world for the Spanish, the other half for the Portuguese. and. Uh, this uh, division line which goes down the middle of the Atlantic also comes up then through the uh, the Pacific and is going to determine where people would speak Portuguese and where people would speak English. Uh, the uh, uh, division line here is a result of the uh, decision of Pope Alexander who's not a particularly uh, pleasant Pope, not a particularly pious or moral Pope uh, but he's looking to keep peace between uh, fellow Catholics, so he divides the world into these two sections. Uh, what they didn't know when he, he basically described where this line would go through the Atlantic Ocean was that uh, South America, uh, in the eastern part of Brazil, protruded past that line. As a result of this, then, what happens is that the, uh, uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas is going to uh, make it possible for the Portuguese to establish a colony in Brazil and this is why in Brazil Portuguese is a common European language that's spoken there rather than Spanish as in much of the rest of South America. Uh, so an interesting little uh, development here that was made uh, in order to keep peace between the Portuguese and the Spanish so they wouldn't compete and uh, fight with each other. But let's move to talk about the Spanish exploration. The Spanish in 1492 had succeeded in reunifying uh, Spain for a long time. They'd been engaged in the, uh, the Reconquista of, of driving the, uh, the Muslims out of Spain. And through the marriage alliance of Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, rulers of Castile and Aragon, they'd succeeded in doing that in 1492. Uh, and th so they had some resources that they could expend on exploration. The Portuguese had uh, certainly eclipsed them in this and uh, they wanted to get involved in this. They didn't have the knowledge that the Portuguese had to know that Christopher Columbus's 
proposal seemed absolutely outrageous. But he was able to secure sufficient funding uh, for three ships and uh, was promised that he would become the Admiral of the Ocean Seas and uh, was made great promises on what all he would gain personally. Now, Christopher Columbus certainly will have made a deal for personal gain, but he's also going to be a fellow who's driven uh, by religious motivations. Uh, Christopher Columbus is a fellow who goes out uh, sort of like uh, the uh, the Portuguese ruler uh, Henry the Navigator in that he's a member of something of a crusading order and he wants to go out in the name of God. This will be one of his major objectives is to take uh, Christianity with him as he goes. Now he's going to sail westward and as he sails westward, uh, what we're going to find is that uh, some of his men are going to uh, despair of coming home. Uh, but he has his three little ships, the uh, flagship, the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pinta. And uh, eventually they'll come to Santo Domingo, uh, to the islands of the Caribbean. And uh, he'll think that he's found the Indies. Now what he's told the uh, the Spanish monarchs was that he believed the world was significantly smaller. The Portuguese knew well that it was much, much larger. They know that the world is uh, more than 24,000 miles around. He thought that he'd only have to sail a few thousand miles to find the Indies. They knew that it was further than his ships could go, uh, than they could carry provisions to go that far. And so they didn't support his explorations. But what he found was a whole continent, uh, one that had been found by the uh, Vikings much earlier, but which had not been exploited. And uh, what he's going to find is there are ocean currents that by sailing south down towards the uh, uh, the, uh, the equator, uh, he could find ocean currents which would take him, and these will come to be known as trade winds, where he's going to take a southerly route to cross the uh, Atlantic going westward, and then take a northerly route uh, to higher latitudes in order to return uh, to Europe. And so he's going to discover, hey, there's there's people here. He, to his dying day, even though he goes on four expeditions, he will believe that uh, he has found the Indies. And this is part of why we call people in the New World Indians. Uh, the name America given to these continents, the North and South American continents, would be something that would wait until 1507 when Amerigo Vespucci, a Florentine uh, cartographer, would popularize the idea what it was that they had found a brand new uh, continent rather than the Indies. Um, and this would be affirmed by 1518 when Balboa crosses over uh, the narrow strip of land that joins North and South America and observes the Pacific Ocean and gives a name to it. Now, at about the same time, we have uh, Magellan, who's going to prove all of this, who goes on a uh, on the first circumnavigation of the world. Uh, he's going to have five ships that he's going to be able to uh, bring together that are go going to go on a uh, an expedition that will... Uh, begin in 1519 and uh, it's going to take a number of years all the way until 1522 uh, to go around the world and he himself will actually not complete the voyage. In fact only one of his five ships uh, commanded by Captain Del Cano will make it all the way around. Uh, Ferdinand Magellan will die at the hands of local inhabitants in the area of the Philippines. Uh, he gives his name to the Straits at the south end of South America the Straits of Magellan, where they were able eventually to make their way through the very high seas there uh, near the continent of Antarctica to get around South America and to get into the Pacific. Uh, to his surprise, it would be a very, very long voyage across the Pacific Ocean, uh, and uh, they, they barely make this expedition. Many people uh, die of disease in the process and dying of hunger as they're scraping the bottom of barrels in order to make it all the way across till they can get to the, uh, the islands where they can be resupplied with fresh water and food. Uh, but then they'll make their way on around uh, the uh, 
the continent of Africa, and they'll make the first successful circumnavigation of the world. This will be a rare exploit for a long time. It, it's going to be uh, uh, still a rare thing uh, three centuries later to make uh, trips around the world. It's an expensive and dangerous proposition, particularly going through those waters at the Straits of Magellan. But enough things are being discovered that they're finding, hey, it's going to be worth this. When Vasco da Gama had gone to India, what they found is that they were able to bring back in their ships uh, movable wealth that was compact, particularly these spices that they'd been paying so much to Muslim middlemen for in Europe. Uh, they can put cloves and cinnamon and other spices in these ships and bring them back in uh, barrels that would uh, more than pay for this journey. It's a, f a fabulously profitable venture uh, to go to the Spice Islands in the east. Now, the Spanish didn't find all those spices that were so fabulously valuable. Um, they didn't find Christians with whom they could connect, and uh, yet perhaps Christopher Columbus is the greatest of the Crusaders in that his discoveries would break the back economically of the Islamic world. Uh, their advantageous trade position was circumvented, and as a result, what we're going to find is the Islamic world is going to decline precipitously. They don't have the funding any longer to build armies, and this is going to curtail uh, their advance into Europe. Uh, what we had mentioned last time was that uh, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, had to fight against the Muslims as far west as Vienna in 1529, but um, we're going to find that the Muslim world is going to be put economically on the ropes and as a result it's not going to have the armies with which to threaten Europe and instead it's going to be uh, put on the defensive as now the Christians are going to be going around them to do their trade and threatening them with newer technologies that they're developing based upon their wealth and based upon their armies. The Spanish exploration is successful in discovering the new world the Spanish explorers will also go around uh, following the treaty of the, the, the line of demarcation under the Treaty of uh, Tordesillas from 1494, and um, they will also establish uh, colonies in the Pacific. As as you draw that line around the globe, what you find is that the islands of the uh, Philippines are on the Spanish side of things, and so they'll name these islands after King Philip II. Uh, the one-time husband of uh, Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary. Um, they'll be named after that King Philip. So we still have the Philippines today as a name that uh, marks the Spanish exploration in this area. And you find a number of uh, Spanish cultural things in the Philippines. But as we focus on the Americas, the Spanish exploited their discoveries. Uh, following Christopher Columbus, he doesn't... Uh, find that much in the way of gold or the spices particularly he's looking for, uh, but certainly vast territories that can be claimed in the name of uh, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And there'd be a number of uh, conquistadors who would follow in his wake. Uh, Christopher Columbus is going to be shortchanged by the uh, Spanish monarchs and not win all of the value of his discoveries. Uh, but uh, others were going to come in and to find great wealth. As they came to South America, uh, what they're going to find in the area we know today as Mexico would be that there's already people groups that have cultures that are there, uh, that live in urban settings, particularly we think about the Aztecs and the empire of uh, uh, Moctezuma. Uh, Cortez, with a relatively small entourage, is going to be able to capture a much, much larger empire which had dominated many other peoples. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. Certainly, he's going to have some uh, technological advantages. He has gunpowder weapons, so he can have some shock and awe, but what you need to understand is that the rate of fire was very, very slow. Uh, but certainly, when you have an Argobus, which is basically a portable cannon uh, that shoots like a shotgun, many projectiles, you can, it can be very devastating, and just the noise and all the smoke would be terrifying. Uh, so they do have that as a technological edge. Uh, they do have a few horses. Uh, they also have dogs. 
that they're going to use in, in battle, which are going to be terrifying to the uh, uh, indigenous populations here of the Americas. But the indigenous population also is somewhat superstitious, and they have been looking forward to the return of a god. Some people speculate perhaps this could be some uh, Viking who in year, earlier generations had said that he was going to come back. Suppose this red-bearded god uh, was going to uh, come back, and they've been looking for uh, Quetzalcoatl to return. Uh, now, if you look at people from South America, you find that they're not terribly hair suits. So somebody with a hairy face would most likely be somebody uh, perhaps who has more of a North European uh, heritage. Uh, it's interesting to speculate, but there are superstitious people who are looking uh, in their uh, documents towards the return of a god who had left them. And there's some suspicion that these great ships that have come uh, could be, uh, the you know, with people having bearded faces, might be uh, representatives of this god who've come. So they're not killed as soon as they get out of their boats along the coast, uh, and they're going to make their way towards Mexico City. Now, in the conflict here, Cortez is going to be able to capture the city with tens of thousands of people, uh, with its many islands there in the island in, in the... Uh, lake that was there in Mexico City at that point in time, uh, largely because he has other people that allied with him. Uh, the Aztecs had many enemies. They demanded a lot of tribute from subject tribes, and uh, so Cortez is able to find, find allies amongst other indigenous American people groups who are wanting to overthrow the tyranny of the Aztecs and their demand for tribute, particularly in the form of human sacrifices. Now, some people get the idea that somehow things were all just perfect here in the New World until Christopher Columbus came and brought subsequent uh, conquistadors who uh, ruined an idyllic situation. If you go visit uh, these uh, pyramid temples in Central America, perhaps what you need to move away from is something of the sanitized view that may be there today and just realize as you walked up those steps that they'd be sticky with human blood as still beating hearts were pulled out of sacrificial victims chests on the top of these places the aztecs were feared but hated and so uh, cortez is able to find allies who are willing to help him and the uh, uh, aztec empire will be brought down and new spain will be established instead. Moving further to the south, um, what they're going to find is that there's silver and this uh, precious metal that the Spanish uh, want to have, and Pizarro is going to be a most notable conquistador who conquers the Incas of South America. Uh, again, a relatively small group of people are able to conquer a vastly larger uh, people group and territory because they have some technological advantages and uh, because they are able to find allies lo locally uh, to help them in this conquest. As the Spanish get to be established, uh, what we'll find is there'll be some uh, intermarriage with local inhabitants, particularly as it's largely males who come over. And so we have mixed race people, uh, mestizos, uh, as a result of intermarriage between these Europeans and these uh, uh, Middle Americans here, and uh, you'd think that that might help people to appreciate that these people are made in the image of God, but uh, there are many people who come who are going to exploit these subjects of the uh, Spanish King Charles V, and uh, look to make their place to basically create out a little feudal state for themselves. But amongst the early uh, exploiters who came over was a man by the name of Bartholomew de las Casas, a very interesting figure. Uh, he becomes a Dominican monk and becomes something of the most uh, vocal proponent of the indigenous peoples. And so in 1542, he would write a book entitled The Tears of the Indians to talk about the sufferings of the Indians under the exploitation 
of the economic media system that was being established, uh, where they're being forced to labor uh, for Spanish folks who'd come over and claim territory. They're being exploited. Uh, he would write other books also, uh, that, I, that All Mankind is One, and a few others, where he's basically writing to Charles V, calling upon the emperor to protect his subjects. Subjects who are uh, suffering from diseases and <clears throat> yet coming to faith in Christianity and so shouldn't be exploited. Uh, so not everybody who comes along is a horrible exploiter who sees uh, uh, the Indians as being uh, subhuman and uh, legitimate targets for exploitation. The Portuguese and the Spanish would continue their exploration uh, outside of the Americas. Uh, they're going to continue their explorations, uh, particularly going over uh, with the, the, the uh, um, Spanish going over to India and uh, Sorry, that was the Portuguese uh, going to India and the Spanish going to the Americas particularly. But uh, the Portuguese will also send uh, emissaries into the coast of Asia, uh, north of India as they'll go along the Chinese coast and uh, even as far north as Japan and uh, look to find new products and to uh, bring these particularly valuable spices that uh, helped improve rather bland and salty European cuisine otherwise. Uh, the impact of exploration would be significant uh, on Europe, uh, on the uh, Americas, and the whole of the world. So let's think here a little bit about the impact of exploration exploitation in Europe. Um, these European explorers brought back from faraway places new products. Some of these products were foodstuffs and other crops, vegetable crops. And so the things they would bring back would be things like maize, uh, field corn, uh, brought from Central America, a basic starch that they ate there, which hadn't been known heretofore in Europe. Potatoes from South America, tomatoes, items that are going to become basic food items in Europe. Uh, can you imagine English food before potatoes or uh, Italian food before you have tomato paste on your pizza or uh, uh, polenta made out of maize. Just basic uh, uh, food groups were not available in Europe that are going to be embraced that come here from the New World. Also when it came to making nice uh, desserts. Uh, in Europe they had sugar cane uh, which they got from the Arab world but uh, you know to make something tasty they didn't have chocolate and vanilla. Uh, these would be products that would come uh, from these discoveries. Based upon uh, these new food supplies, we're going to see that there's going to be subsequent population growth in Europe uh, where they're able to sustain larger populations on the same amount of land uh, because crops like uh, maize, you know, you put one seed in the ground and you get 300 seeds back. This is a far greater crop yield than what you would get from uh, something like wheat. Uh, potatoes. You, know, you take a portion of potato with eyes in it, you plant it in the ground, and uh, you know you can very soon have tons of potatoes off of uh, a single acre of ground. Three acres of potatoes would more than enough provide the caloric requirements for a family. So this is going to have a dramatic effect on Europe in the years to come as they have these new materials and amongst new materials they'd also have new raw materials that would come their way. Uh, particularly they're going to have uh, things they value that were very transportable like precious gemstones and precious metals. Uh, but this is going to have a dramatic impact uh, in Europe also. 
particularly it's going to affect the economy. So the second area of uh, impact would be economic impact. In 100 years, inflation is going to change prices dramatically in Europe. They're going to see a fourfold increase in prices by the year 1500 because of all the silver that's being brought in to Europe. The, uh, this is going to cause a change in people's lives. Now, on the other side, what we'll find is that the cost of spices will decline. These fabulously expensive spices, uh, as the supply grows, the price will decline. But uh, what we're going to find is that uh, prices are going to go up uh, as there's silver brought in and there's more silver. And uh, yet at the same time, this isn't going to make things all happy and uh, uh, profitable for people in Europe because while prices go up, wages stay much the same. And uh, the result is that there's going to be many people who are going to be put into economic hard times. But there are profits to be made by explorers, and so this is going to help fuel the quest for new trade, new discoveries in exotic places where you could come and uh, have something a monopoly. If you're the one who knows how to get there and knows uh, you know, something that you don't share with just everybody else. Well, there's a lot of positive things that have happened here in Europe and some that are negative. Uh, there had also come to be new diseases brought to Europe. Uh, these diseases would continue on to this day in some areas. So there's some mosquito-borne diseases that will be brought from the New World, things like yellow fever, um, which brings on great, uh, it's a mosquito-borne disease, it's going to bring a great deal of uh, distress, particularly as uh, uh, people are going to uh, die from dehydration as they are going to be uh, vomiting so much and uh, having uh, dreadful diarrhea problems. Um, so this will be a, a devastating problem that comes from the New World. Uh, but a second disease that's going to come from the New World, from the, uh, uh, the indigenous people of the Americas, would be venereal diseases that hadn't been known previously in Euro Europe. And uh, so Europe sees both positive and negatives uh, from this exploration, exploitation of the world. Now, on the other side, what we recognize is that the uh, people of the Americas and people of Asia and the Pacific would also find an impact uh, from exploration. They too would receive new products and they would learn some new ideas. Amongst the new ideas that they gained was that they, they learned about the name of Jesus. Christianity was spread by these uh, Portuguese and uh, Spanish uh, explorers. They brought their Christianity with them. Uh, it was, certainly was a Christianity that was uh, uh, still very much dominated by Catholicism. And oftentimes what's going to happen is there's going to be syncretism in these areas. Uh, but there are other times when the Christians are seen as being uh, uh, intrusive and their Christianity would lead to uh, some resistance, particularly in places like Asia, where people are going to resist Christianity when the Christians would uh, destroy their local idols and uh, the like. And so Christianity will be something that will be an idea that brings a mixed reception. Uh, but remember that in... Uh, the Christianity brought by the Portuguese and the Spanish, that they don't have a focus on salvation by grace uh, that comes through faith. Instead, it's very much a work salvation orientation of the sacramental system. And so they don't have a whole lot of good news uh, that they bring with them about how you can be assured of salvation. Um, other ideas and products that are brought along, certainly there's uh, uh, for people in the Americas. Uh, they've basically been using uh, Stone Age culture. Um, down there in South America, they had uh, volcanic sources that provide them with volcanic glass, known as obsidian, from which they could chip uh, axe heads and knives and make arrowheads. Certainly these are deadly weapons, but uh, they're nothing compared to the weaponry that is brought on by the uh, 
use of gunpowder weapons and uh, uh, you know hardened armor uh, that was uh, used by the Portuguese and so metallurgy is going to be an important discovery uh, for Indians in the Americas uh, they too like the people in Mesoamerica would use stone tools uh, but uh, they would use a lot of leather uh, to make products uh, they did have some use of ceramics uh, but their ceramics weren't fired terribly hard and uh, so there's a number of things that they're going to learn certainly they knew about the use of fire but uh, uh, metallurgical technology would be something that's going to be brought um, by these Europeans particularly the uh, fabrication of iron tools and uh, those hard edged weapons that can also be made those tools of war which they had which gave them an advantage uh, to have comparatively lightweight swords that they can wield and spears with these hardened points that could pierce through uh, uh, armor made of uh, vegetable products so lots of new ideas and products are brought to the Americas and also to places in Asia uh, amongst new uh, materials brought uh, would be certain animals domesticated animals uh, prior to this time in the Americas they didn't have horses uh, so there were no Plains Indians riding horses chasing buffalo uh, until after the Europeans come and the horse is introduced to the American continents uh, you know, the Navajo didn't raise sheep uh, sheep would be a, something that they'd bring um, domesticated cattle a variety of fruits uh, you know we might think of oranges as being uh, native in Florida but uh, you know there's reason why there's counties named Valencia in Florida uh, it's a Spanish name and so citrus fruits and other uh, uh, fruiting trees are going to be brought by the Europeans which subsequently are going to be established in the Americas and so those grapes that you eat from Chile uh, and uh, from South America many of these products are going to be introduced by the uh, Europeans who come here into the New World and they're going to take the same things as they go to other parts of the world uh, and uh, their uh, technological advantages will give them uh, a leg up sometimes on indigenous peoples in the various parts of the world other things that they bring uh, to the areas they meet will be new diseases some of these diseases were seen as just being an irritation in Europe they didn't necessarily kill people they might maim people in ways but uh, many of you today uh, have never had the experience of having measles some of us who are old enough have had a variety of measles along the way the uh, black measles the German measles the three-day measles um, I've known lots of measles along the way but most of you today have had a, a, a MMR a mumps measles and rubella uh, shot so you've never had the experience of having measles perhaps you've had chicken pox so you have some idea of the uh, the scratchy experience of having measles and the general feelings and malaise that come with that but typically we think about these as being childhood diseases in Europe that uh, uh, were inconvenient but didn't cause too much harm now the fact is that uh, you know pregnant women can uh, the fetus in a pregnant woman can be uh, blinded by uh, coming into by their mother having measles uh, but um, this wasn't something that killed large portions of the population this would be different however in the Americas and in Africa where the indigenous populations hadn't uh, built up some greater resistance to measles and um, uh, even to this day there are many many, many people in Africa that die of measles uh, as children something else that we think of as not typically bothering us is the flu oh we get to be uncomfortable and discomfortable you know discomforted for the weekend three or four days and we get over the flu the malaise goes away and we felt nasty for a while but the flu comes and the flu goes when we get to be older or perhaps our health is compromised then perhaps we think about getting a flu, flu shot 
sometimes perhaps were moved by the concern about there being some sort of flu epidemic. Uh, flu is particularly a, 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 a disease that's passed amongst people, but it's also carried by um, animals at times. So you have swine flu or various types of bird flu. Most flu is, is transmitted uh, through avian uh, means, through birds. Uh, but in the Americas, they didn't know the flu. And so when people come from Europe and they have the flu, um, this doesn't uh, do much more than discomfort the invaders, but yet it's going to devastate the populations of the Americas, where millions of people will die as a result of the flu. Um, another disease would be pertussis. That would be whooping cough. Most of you have a DPT shot that you had that made your arm feel heavy along the way. And you've never had the uh, misery of having a whooping cough. Another disease that we most usually think that uh, a, a well-fed uh, person who's of moderately good health should survive that with no great problem. We have greater concern, however, with smallpox. This would be another disease they bring from the old world to the new world, and it's going to devastate populations. This is going to be uh, very, very important in that it's going to wipe out, in some places, as much as 90% of the population. We don't have census figures for the new world, but disease is going to be devastating. And so you have Indian peoples who don't particularly want to work uh, for the Spanish and people who are dying off. And so uh, the, the Spanish are going to have a relatively easy time dominating the remaining population. And in looking for labor, they're going to be looking for laborers who are going to be able to resist some of these diseases. And they're going to bring enslaved populations from Africa to work uh, to grow crops that would be particularly lucrative. Something they've been depending upon in Europe. Everybody's got taste buds on their tongue that help them to enjoy sweets, but prior to this time, the only sweets they've had in Europe would be either honey, occasional bit of honey, or uh, through having dried fruits, uh, dried grapes. You can make raisins, which would be sweet. Uh, this would be where they're looking for sweets, is from dried fruits, dried apples, for example. But uh, with sugar, you can have... You know, sweet things that are satisfying and uh, uh, sugar is going to drive a great deal of wrong and a great deal of the economy along the way. Uh, what they find is that they can bypass the sugar sources in the Middle East uh, that are controlled by the Muslims. The Muslims controlled sugar and they controlled spices and uh, these things are fabulously expensive. But by growing sugar cane in the uh, tropical areas of South America and the islands and uh, in Brazil, they're going to find that they can grow sugar cane uh, rather easily. And from sugar cane, they can either make sugar or they can ferment it and make rum, uh, both of which would be highly valued in Europe and uh, are going to be so valued that people are going to be willing to uh, enslave other people uh, to gain the profits. There will be widespread impact of these discoveries of the Europeans, these uh, these ge geographical explorations, on world economics. I've already suggested that there's immense inflation that takes place in uh, in Europe with a fourfold uh, increase in prices uh, that happens following this influx of Spanish silver. Uh, there's going to be uh, money, however, that monarchs are going to be used to to fund armies, and we're going to find that much of that uh, Spanish gold is going to be spent by uh, Philip II in trying to fight against uh, the Protestants in the Netherlands. Uh, there will be money that will be available to uh, build great basilicas like St. Peter's Basilica in, uh, in Rome. Uh, this is where some of this gold is going to be expended and uh, to build great palaces and the like in in Europe. But there will also be commercial expansion that takes place in, in Europe as people find there are profits to be made uh, and there's new markets to be exploited. All these places in uh, Americas, they want to buy products that they make in Europe. And so if you have an iron foundry in Europe, you can sell metal tools to people in the Americas. Uh, an, an iron axe is much better 
than a stone axe. Uh, it may rust, but it can be sharpened uh, and is much more uh, effective uh, than using some obsidian uh, axe to try and chop down trees, for example. Uh, the expanding markets will uh, provide for other products other than uh, metallurgy as uh, people want to have some of the manufactured goods that are coming out of Europe, particularly some of the textiles and uh, other manufactured goods. And so in Africa, there's going to be a great desire for this. Now in Africa, they developed iron technology at an earlier time, but they're not doing anything on nearly the same large scale as they are in Europe. And so the Europeans can uh, beat them in price and, and provide much greater supply of uh, metal-edged tools, weapons that are going to be used that uh, will enlarge many of the tribal wars that take place in Africa and uh, which are going to uh, lead to their sale of POWs as uh, slaves. Uh, the same uh, manufactured goods, particularly metals, will be highly valued in uh, Asia as well. And uh, so people are going to be willing to make exchanges there's a market for these things, and the Europeans find things that they want, they want to take home. Uh, not just those spices that they first went looking for, which were so lucrative. Uh, they find that they have a place to sell goods that they make at home, and a place to buy things at a uh, advantageous price that they can bring home and sell, once again, as a profit. So, with the uh, growth of a world economy where people are trading over long distances, there's more and more ships that are being built. This is building the maritime uh, focus of the uh, countries along the Atlantic seaboard. And they're, they're building more and more ships. We're going to find that some relatively small countries geographically are going to grow to be world powers. And so we're going to find that the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch, are going to become a major economic power as they depend upon ships, and the English also. Uh, these two powers are going to eclipse the Spanish in time and uh, take over the Portuguese uh, trading posts along the coast and to expand their markets. One of the ways they do this is that uh, in England and in the Netherlands uh, they develop joint stock companies. Perhaps uh, amongst the most famous of these would be the Dutch East India Company, but we'll find the British have their India companies also, uh, which are going to allow people to buy into a enterprise uh, where they own a portion. Again, it's such a big enterprise to fit out a ship, uh, to, to recruit the sailors to go on that ship, to put the merchandise on that ship uh, that, uh, you know, single individuals can't afford to do that. Particularly when you want to send out multiple ships because you want to bring multiple ships back. So when you buy stock, you own a portion of the company. You don't. Have, it's not just one individual invests in purchasing and manning a ship and supplying it with uh, trade goods. Instead, it's this much larger company made by multiple investors who own shares. And these companies are able to return magnificent returns, sometimes returns of over 25% are gained each year as a result of the uh, expansion. These companies are going to uh, inspire the economy of Western Europe, and they're going to be uh, a backbone of what helps put Europe in a, a position of advantage over so many of these other people. There's resources that are able to be brought to bear on these types of tasks. And it'll be some time yet till we have uh, the development of national banks, but uh, the use of money as more money is coming into the economy and as they're developing these uh, joint stock companies, this is going to be pivotal to the growth of Europe's uh, international economic domination. So joint stock companies are particularly important uh, companies here that are going to be able to fund these shippings and these, uh, these, these uh, economic enterprises. But the various countries that have been developing here have their own interests also. And what we're going to see is that they develop the idea that the state should get involved in economic matters. Because when you have countries like Portugal that bring uh, 
goods from other countries or the Spanish bring goods from other countries, what can happen is that uh, they can uh, affect the local trade of your country. And so what happens is they get the idea that there's only so much money to be had. Uh, basically the idea is the pie is only so large. And if you want to have more of the pie for your country, a larger slice, you basically have to take it away from somebody else. So how are you going to do that? Well one of the ways you do that is you, you keep gold and silver in your own country. And you do that by restricting trade uh, with other people groups. Uh, you make it less uh, advantageous. So one of the ways you do that is through taxes. So if you want to uh, limit, we'll say, the, the English spending money on uh, wine that comes from France, uh, then you tax that wine. Uh, and they'll find something else to drink because they get basically taxed out of, uh, out of business. This business of taxes and protecting the local uh, production will be an ongoing issue in Western society all the way to the present. Again, what we're going to find is that we have free trade agreements that uh, some people find to be uh, negative. Other people uh, espouse this because they want the, the best price on various things. Uh, and they don't want there to be economic barriers. But the states of Europe get involved because they see their self-interest is being affected. And so they pursue a policy known as mercantilism. This is where the state uh, controls economies by uh, taxing imported goods and promoting local manufacturing of uh, and domestic production as opposed to having these uh, these foreign goods uh, brought into these various countries along the way. Europe and the world's economy is also affected by the slave trade. With enslaved persons, you can force people to work in adverse situations for wages uh, at a cost uh, that it allows great profits to be made. This is going to particularly drive the slave trade that's going to bring slaves to the Americas. Now, the Americas are not the only place where slaves are being bought and sold. Slaves had long been uh, forced into labor in Africa as various tribes fought against each other. And in the Muslim world, they'd long had slaves. And in fact, along the east coast of Africa, slavery will continue uh, much longer until the British are going to intervene in the early 19th century uh, to try and cut off this slave trade. And we'll talk at a later time about the efforts of uh, people like David Livingston to stop uh, the slave trade in the Islamic world. Uh, so there's a, a very large and old slave trade that takes place in East Africa uh, that go back much earlier than the coming of the Europeans. This is, in fact, one of the interpretations of the Great Zimbabwe Ruins in southern Africa is that the, the area that's known as the Temple is actually a place which uh, is structured to control the movement of people. And the thought is particularly perhaps that was the movement of slaved persons uh, who would be taken off to the east. Certainly there are Chinese trade goods that are there that are found, amongst other things. So there's a, a whole trade going on in the... Uh, in the area of the uh, Indian Ocean and the uh, Pacific that uh, was little known in Europe. A trade which will be curtailed by the coming of the great competitors here with their superior ships and know-how uh, that will take place. But uh, focusing first of all here on the slave trade, what we find is that uh, slave trade existed in Africa and people had been enslaved over the years, but uh, with the coming of Christianity in Europe, the slave trade had been uh, uh, made largely unprofitable. There are some people who were tied to the land in various ways as serfs, uh, and people were certainly still exploited. But um, slavery was something that was seen to be uh, incompatible uh, for Christians to enslave other Christians. And so they're going to take advantage of the fact that many of these people are not Christians, and that would justify enslaving them. 
uh, because they're not my Christian brother or sister. And uh, something that develops in the Atlantic is what some people call a triangular trade as uh, merchants look to uh, enlarge their profits. Uh, they would sail from Europe down uh, to West Africa where they could pick up slave people along the coasts from uh, African slave traders and um, transport them then. Uh, what they'd trade to the African slave traders would be such things as metal manufactured goods, uh, textiles, and the like that uh, were much desired in Africa. And uh, they could also trade for gold, which they desired to have. But uh, they could pick up uh, slaves at a relatively cheap price and ship them across the uh, Atlantic Ocean using the trade winds and take them to the area of Brazil and the Caribbean. There in those places they'd be forced to work on sugar plantations. Plantations which would produce either uh, the sugar that would be taken back to Europe, which is so highly prized, or rum, which was also a valuable commodity uh, as a highly alcoholic spiritus beverage. and. Um, uh, so the merchants made profit on every exchange along the way, uh, going around uh, the Atlantic. Uh, as people make profits, other people are going to build more ships and uh, try to get in on this action. And as a result, we're going to find that thousands of enslaved persons are brought to the Americas, particularly to work in Brazil and in islands of the Caribbean where there's enough moisture where they can grow sugarcane, uh, places like Jamaica and uh, other islands in the Caribbean uh, that are famous for uh, historically for sugar growth, sugar cane growth. Um, over in the uh, Pacific, uh, the Dutch are going to come to take over the Portu much of the Portuguese trade and uh, they have A large amount of influence there and the British are going to get in on this uh, exploration also. Now the British exploration at this point in time hasn't brought them a huge number of profits but uh, the British are going to explore uh, the northern part of North America. We think particularly of John Cabot although uh, that's an anglicization of his name. He's actually Giovanni. He's another Italian uh, explorer and uh, uh, the Spanish have been moving up the coast of uh, the Americas up um, to Florida and uh, moving up the Atlantic coast, uh, particularly we think about uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh, Verrazano is a uh, explorer who's coming up the coast. Uh, the, the, uh, the Spanish actually make uh, a few outposts here in eastern North Carolina, as far north as this, but uh, here in the north, what we're going to find is that northern European competitors are going to get in on the act. So the French and the English are going to be doing exploration here in the northern part of uh, the Americas. Uh, like others, they're going to be limited to largely settlements along the coast initially. Uh, like the Spanish and others are looking for quick profits, but uh, what they're going to find is that there are resources here large dimension timber to help build ships, for example, and naval supplies uh, that help to uh, waterproof ships here in North Carolina, uh, and also tobacco. Uh, tobacco will be something that will be also moved down to the islands of the Caribbean, uh, hence we have Cuban cigars, but uh, the American Indians are growing tobacco, which they uh, uh, use and which will be imported as a profitable crop as people come to uh, appreciate its, uh, the effects of the nicotine in it uh, in Europe. Uh, King James of England uh, finds it to be a noxious and pernicious weed uh, and a bad habit, but yet it's one that comes to be widely accepted in England where people uh, sometimes smoke it in pipes uh, and also uh, use it as snuff where they would uh, variously either inhale it or uh, chew on it and gain the uh, 
the buzz that they'd get out of the nicotine, helping them to be more alert and active in their work. Uh, this comes to be something of a uh, social vice that uh, comes here from the New World and is embraced in the European world. Um, the English are going to send out, uh, they, they get into this business a little bit later, but as uh, Elizabeth is in competition with the Spanish, she's happy to uh, have her sea dogs <coughs> engage in piracy, basically, against the Spanish trade ships to intercept them, to uh, seize their treasures. So you have famous Elizabethan era uh, privateers, and uh, all like uh, Hawkins and uh, others that will uh, uh, be famous for their uh, exploits against the uh, the Spanish and their plunder of uh, treasure ships. Uh, but the English will also get in the business of establishing a colony, and the Virginia colony is established uh, under a charter uh, given to people like Sir Walter Raleigh and other investors in a, in a company. And uh, the Virginia company uh, seeks to, amongst other things, the people who are going to be sent are going to try and find gold, but they're going to be frustrated. They'll have to wait all the way up until the 1830s before gold is finally found in the American East Coast uh, near Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, but uh, they're going to search for gold, but what they're going to find instead is there's advantages to be made, particularly in growing tobacco, and uh, this is going to be the lucrative crop that keeps the uh, Virginia Company going, and uh, which will uh, inspire other people to eventually follow in the heels of those who settle down. Uh, the initial efforts out here at uh, Roanoke Island uh, did not last, as uh, they were not supplied in time, and they abandon that uh, location. But in the subsequent years, the Jamestown colony would be established in the Chesapeake Bay area, and uh, other colonists coming from England find, uh, as their drive, looking for a place where they can uh, live safely and securely and profitably would be something to drive them, someplace where they could particularly practice their religious uh, convictions. This is going to drive many uh, colonists out of uh, King James's England uh, to come to the New World to establish uh, religious settlements. And uh, we'll have the Plymouth Colony and others which are going to be established uh, by the English. They're not the only ones, however, looking towards uh, Northern America. The French are looking to exploit things also, and they are going to particularly find their way down the uh, St. Lawrence Waterway and explore the interior. The waterways are the major route of movement. This is true for the English. Uh, you know, why do you have settlements in places like Philadelphia? Well, they're able to go up the Delaware River. Uh, here in eastern North Carolina, they're able to travel up the sounds. The, the waterways are the highways of the time period particularly here in places like East North Carolina where you have the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, slogging your way through uh, you know, primal growth forests, apex forests, and through the uh, the dark underneath the shade of the canopy uh, wasn't particularly comfortable. It was hard. It was easy to lose your way and very difficult to make any kind of fast progress, let alone carry anything large. Whereas by boat you could float uh, goods and people comparably quickly. And so the waterways are going to be the avenues by which people uh, move up into the interior and uh, find places where they can settle and uh, produce food. And these settlements were seen as uh, places that the mother countries could uh, have as markets and uh, the indigenous peoples were people who uh, they could do business with and find that they would make a profitable exchange. The French are going to be particularly focused on exchanging uh, uh, manufactured goods for animal pelts uh, up in what we know today as Canada. Um, there's not going to be as much of that done by the British uh, in the uh, more southern reaches. But whether it was the Portuguese or the Spanish, uh, the Dutch or the English, uh, they're having an impact on world history and they're spreading their culture. Western society has spread uh, widely um, across Europe as a result. 
and it has an impact uh, on the peoples with whom they encounter that they encounter as well as European uh, society uh, back at home um, where they find themselves to be uh, in a position of increasing dominance and there's motivation to press ahead with technological innovation and uh, there's foodstuffs that are going to provide for increased population growth which will allow cities to grow bigger which will allow people to live off of the land in greater percentages uh, cities are going to grow because with these new crops like potatoes and maize uh, off of the land that's already under cultivation they can grow enough calories that you can sustain people in these urban settings and people can specialize in various crafts as a result there's new markets for all the the, the wool that's being grown in countryside that's hard to exploit otherwise you know the sheep can eat the the grasses in Europe and they can then weave it into textiles which people in uh, places like Africa want to buy that uh, new crops are going to come into Europe particularly cotton is going to be something that's very highly valued uh, and uh, cotton is a, a, a crop that uh, can be dyed and is very uh, durable and lightweight and um, they're going to find that cotton that they find in places like India uh, will be something of a resource they can have and then when they discern that crop can be grown in the Americas uh, this is going to become an important export from the Americas alongside of tobacco and uh, sugar and the like uh, that come from the New World. What we want to think about this week as we engage in our discussion, particularly in regard to this lecture, would be now, how these voyages of discovery have shaped Western civilization. To think about how the sociological changes take place in Europe. What all comes to be possible because of this wealth that comes from the New World. How the uh, people of uh, Europe are changed uh, as they come to sometimes think, think of themselves as being superior to other people as a result of their uh, technological advantages and uh, areas particularly like weapons and metallurgy and the like. Ultimately this will help us then as we look towards writing an essay on the final exam to think about how Western civilization has been uh, built upon people who've gone before and ideas and developments that sometimes still have an impact in our world today. Uh, one of the things we observe today is you know why people speak uh, Portuguese still in Brazil. Well, an odd little peace treaty in uh, 1492 to keep peace between Catholic subjects uh, has a continuing impact then uh, in the world today. I trust that the uh, Lord will bless your discussions together and you'll encourage each other in that. Thank you for your attention.